In this video, Naval Goddard will talk about one of the universe's most potent laws, the law of assumption. One of the most potent laws for manifesting anything is a law of assumption. But in order to use it, you must first lift the veil of the senses and enter another dimension. The simplicity of Naval Goddard's teachings is one of my favorite aspects of them. You must realize that your consciousness and the energy of your intention will flow in the direction of where your attention is focused. Your focus must be off of this physical reality if you are to use the law of assumption. You need to go to a different world with no concept of time or space, in a location where everything occurs immediately. This is the setting for Naval's occasional references to the fourth dimension. In this version of reality, your desire has already materialized. Most people attempt to create a new reality while simultaneously focusing on a 3D world, which is in direct opposition to everything they are attempting to manifest. That is all there is to it. From the perspective of already having what you want, you will view yourself. Consider the world as if your desire, whatever it may be, were already a reality. If having your dream home is what you want, ask yourself, how do I see the world now that I'm already in my dream home? Then. Give it life, vividness, and strong emotions until it feels so real to you that it makes you really excited a hundred times over, a million times over. All of it is up to you. As long as you keep doing it until it begins to feel real to you, I don't really care how long you do it for. Do it until you have a firm understanding of it. Then you can watch amazing things happen. You won't believe it either. They will take place in front of your very eyes you'll be amazed to discover that your dream home is exactly as you imagined it. Before we continue, let's let Naval speak for himself. Be sure to pay close attention and take pleasure. The Lord is one. There aren't two gods, there's only one God. So we have to find out who this one God is. If I should speak to you now and say, and speak of your God, the chances are, and you can give it any number you want, a million and one, or trillions and one, that hearing the word your God, that your mind will instantly think of someone or something external to yourself. I do not care how you form it, but you will think of God, your God, as external to yourself. But if I spoke of your imagination, I am certain you will think of no one but yourself. Could it be that your imagination is the God of Scripture? If you read Scripture carefully, you will find that it is. There is only one creative power. And the word of the Lord so the word translated law is the Hebrew yod he vav he. It's not sounded, so we do tighter sounded, it can be translated as the Lord, and sometimes Jehovah, and sometimes they'll translate it, which they shouldn't, say as God. But the Lord, yes. The word Jehovah, yes. Well, the word Jesus begins yod he vav So here we find the same root in the word Jesus. Therefore, they call him the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and I will let you hear my word. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at his wheel, and the vessel in his hand was spoiled that he was making of clay. But he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to him to do. Well, the word potter, you think in terms of a man, I know in little Barbados where I was born, I would go up to the potter's field. And there he was working these things out of clay. Things where we would put the normal water into it, and in some strange way it chilled it. 
You could always depend upon a nice cold, cold glass of water if poured from what we called the mump. It was a thing made of clay, had a little clay top and an open thing like a huge big teapot, but made of clay in the hottest moment of the day. If you poured it from that clay, it was always nice and cold. And so I could see him now form the entire thing with his hand. But in scripture, the word potter means imagination. You'll find what I've just quoted in the 18th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. You'll also find it in the 64th chapter of the book of Isaiah. Thou art our father, our potter. Who is the father? Well, the Lord. Well, the true translation of the word Lord, which is yod hey bau is I am. And if I should go to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers sent me unto you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say? Say to them, I am. That is who I am. Say to them, I am has sent me unto you. Not the Lord has sent me unto you, or Jehovah has sent me unto you, or Jesus has sent me unto you. For these always take the mind outside of self. But say to them, I am has sent me unto you. You want to know his name? Just say, I am that is who I am. That is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. But man will not bring himself to believe that that is God. He will not bring himself to believe that his own wonderful human imagination is God. And that is God. That forms everything in this world. There is no thing that you now see in the world but what it was once only imagined. The image preceded the objective fact. So objective reality is purely produced through imagining. The suits you wear, the dresses you wear, the chairs in which you are seated, the building that now houses you, everything was only imagined. And then it became an objective reality. And we think the objective state is its reality. It's not so at all. That which is the imaginative image is its reality. Destroy the objective fact. I can reproduce it from the imaginative image. It is all within us. Our own wonderful human imagination is the God of Scripture. Now we are told, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him. Yet the world knew Him not. So you walk the earth, as the cause of the phenomena of your life. You could be, if you are vivid in your imagination, be influencing the imaginations of unnumbered people, and you, unseen by them, are the cause of the phenomena of life. But if they are passive, they fall under your influence. If you are powerful in your imagination, you are creating the phenomena of life. Those who are not in control of their imagination were moved by the wind with every little room, every opinion. They simply sway from side to side as you in control move them. You are the one treading in the wine cell. No one knows it could be in a dungeon, serving a long, long pan of fire. And while there, each nut with a desire. And then in your silent moment, you are completely in control of that vivid 
creative power of the universe, your imagination, and you influence all the people of the world. For all things by a law divine in one another being nature. I couldn't see you if you did not penetrate my brain. I couldn't, I couldn't hear you if you didn't penetrate it. So all things by a law divine in one another's being nature. The whole vast world is one. You in control of the creative power, which is your own wonderful human imagination. You can sway the entire vast world. If you can't do it, if some dictators have tried to do it, they're bringing their propaganda machine. And then they try to force man into a certain shell, into a certain state. And quite often they succeed up to a point. But you, without the aid of any machine in this world, you can change the structure of your world by the control of your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. That is the Lord spoken of in Scripture. That is Jesus. But can you imagine? For so that is God in operation. God only acts and is in existing beings or men. So how does he act? As I imagine. I imagine anything. He now that I, even I, am me. I choose and I make a lie. I wound and I heal. And none can deliver out of my hand. I raise my hand to heaven and cry, I live forever. That's the immortal you, it cannot die. When you say I am, it cannot die. It's not confined to the little garment that you're wearing. That's a mask that you put upon yourself that you may be seen in this world of shadows. But you are not the mask that you wear. You are an immortal being, and that immortal being is God the Father, as spoken of in Scripture. But I would like you to begin to feel it is simply I am. And by that, imagination. You can sit down this very moment and begin to dream the most glorious dream in the world concerning yourself. At the moment of the dream, reason denies it. Your senses deny it. But if you dare to assume that assumption, that you are already that in its fullness, and persist in that assumption, it will harden into fact. Luke said, I met Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I dined with them last night. And I say to Isaiah, do you really believe that an assumption will harden into flesh? He said, all prophets believe that it does, but today not very many are capable of an assumption of anything. They change from moment to moment. If I could dare to assume that I am, what at the moment reason denies and persists in my assumption in a way that I do not know and I need not be concerned about, it will actually find the necessary means to externalize itself within my world. That I know from experience and scripture teaches it from beginning to end. This is the law that came after the promise. The promise came first, and that is irrevocable. No one can fail in the fulfillment of the promise. You will awaken one day as God himself, and you will know it. That is the promise. But while we are moving through this veil of tears, we have a law, and the law is the law of assumption. If I dare to believe that what I have said will come to pass and not question it, well, go your way, it will come to pass. Here's a simple, simple thing. My father, in a little tiny island, it's only 21 miles long by 14 wide. That's where I was born. He is not 
a brilliant mind. He's gone from this world at the age of 85. His time was up and he departed. He had no formal education, very little education. The war came, the First World War came to an end in 1918. The boys began to return in 1919. And these troop ships came in bringing back the boys from Europe and from North Africa. He heard the officers, the captain, and the stewards discuss the next World War. I can hear my father now. For in 1919, I was born in 1905, so here I am, 14 years of age. And all of us are now growing up, young men. My father said, we'll have another war in 20 years. He'll break in 1939. Mother said, Joseph, why do you say that? Look at all of our boys. They'll all be ready for the war. Why do you say that? And there were nine boys, one girl. He said it will happen in 1939, 20 years. He even named the two guys and placed it on the side of Germany, the Japan, on the side of Germany leaving England and France and Russia. He didn't mention the others. Therefore, naturally, you took it for granted that America would come in to defend the liberty that we have inherited from England. What we now call the Bill of Rights. All this is part of the foundation of that English-speaking world. And he thought, well, now America was coming at the appropriate time, but in 1919, it will break. Well, on September the 1st, 1919, it broke. I was driving through from Montreal. I just spent two weeks on the Canadian border. Went into Montreal, and I had, well, champagne and stout. It was a delightful drink, by the way. And so I had a few of those, we got into the car and started back, and on the way back, here comes the radio, and here is the news. England has just declared war on Germany. Germany moved on Poland, England had a treaty and declared war. That was September 1919. Now, my father was not a prophet, but he firmly believed in his assumption. He was spreading the wine press in this tiny little island, called Barbados, 21 miles long by 14 at its widest point. So you don't have to be in a palace. You don't have to be in the White House. You don't have to be in any prominent place or the Vatican. Someone in a dungeon this night is spreading the wine bread. And who knows what's going to happen when she has spread the wine bread. 